And a hearty welcome to one and all. This is episode 93 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Monday evening here with me. If you're checking out this episode on the YouTube channel and haven't done so already and are enjoying the content, don't forget to click like, subscribe, comment, turn on those notifications. Or if you're catching up with this episode on the audio platforms such as Spotify or iTunes, same rule applies. Click like, subscribe, turn on those notifications. So tonight I want to put a spotlight on a fantastic filmmaker who is known to cineasts, casual movie fans, even people familiar with older films might not know the name and might not be able to name any of his films offhand. And that would be John Frankenheimer, who I would argue is probably the greatest director who never received so much as a Best Director nomination. Um, But he made some of the most indelible films of the 1960s and made movies of consistently high quality and craftsmanship really until the end of his career. And he had the kind of career that spanned generations of actors. Um, He worked with De Niro and Jean Reno in a late 90s film called Ronin. He worked with Ben Affleck and Charlize Theron and Gary Sinise in a film called Reindeer Games, which I didn't like, but a lot of people have told me that it's underrated. You should give it another shot. He would be 94 today. He has been gone for quite some time. But the movies in particular in his career, and some of you may have heard, I'll just throw some names of movies. He did the sequel to The French Connection. Uh, William Friedkin, who did the original, didn't want to come back, or I I don't know what the mechanics were. Um, He did a famous film with Burt Lancaster, Birdman of Alcatraz. He made a movie called The Train. He did Grand Prix, uh, Seven Days in May, Burt Lancaster. And um, he also did a really unusual for the time and a movie that could not be made today uh, starring Bruce Dern in the mid 70s called Black Sunday. Stop me if this sounds familiar. It's about a terrorist that tries to blow up a blimp over the Super Bowl. Try to imagine getting that movie made today. 50 years ago, people like, we shouldn't be making movies like this. John Frankenheimer said, well, I'm going to And Bruce Stern, who always played those kinds of wacky characters, kind of his trademark, um, yeah, he really fucking sells it. But the two movies I want to talk about in particular, and why Frankenheimer to me is not just any other Hollywood craftsman who worked for decades in the business, but somebody who did different things and was in his own way groundbreaking and pioneering, and his work is still replicated today. Even if a young filmmaker or somebody interested in film doesn't specifically say, oh, I'm, I'm doing this because of John Frankenheimer, they might be saying, oh, I'm doing this because of this movie that he directed. So some of you know that about 20 years ago, uh, Denzel Washington made a movie called The Manchurian Candidate, and it got good reviews. It was pretty successful at the box office, if memory serves. Now, Denzel was just knocking out one hit after another. I want to say this was Denzel's next movie after John Q. It was in that range. Uh, So he was still, you know, lighting it up. It was a remake uh, of John Frankenheimer's 1962 film, Manchurian Candidate, which stars Frank Sinatra, yes, the Frank Sinatra, Lawrence Harvey, Janet Leigh, and a terrifying Angela Lansbury. And some Gen Xers and uh, even maybe some elder millennials just think of Angela Lansbury as the nice old lady from Murder, She Wrote. She plays one of the most horrific, diabolical villains who rarely raises her voice ever. A Manchurian Candidate deals with a Korean War veteran who is brainwashed and forced against his will to carry out certain acts, not only against his will, without his knowledge. And then you get into whole kinds of legal conundrums where if somebody is basically a sleeper, has no idea that they're committing crimes, and in fact would not commit these crimes, how do we charge them? Do we get it under some kind of an insanity situation so that they don't do the same time since they clearly were not in control of their bodies and souls at the time of the crime? The Manchurian Candidate is a movie I've seen three times, and it is a difficult movie. It's upsetting. It's depressing. 
but it is riveting. It's just amazing. And probably the best film act, you know, Sinatra won uh, Oscar for From Here to Eternity, which was about, I believe, nine years prior. But I think that his finest film acting was in A Manchurian Candidate, because he's essentially playing the hero. And Lawrence Harvey is not really the villain, but he's the guy who's basically been screwed with, you know, in Korea, where he just gets completely fucked up and brainwashed. And um, it is a scary movie. The Denzel version is good. The original is better. The movie I really wanted to talk about, though, and the movie that when I think of John Frankenheimer, the first film that comes to mind, is a movie that he made in 1966 with Rock Hudson called Seconds. It's a science fiction film. It's a drama. It's a thriller. It has mystery elements. It's not really one movie. I guess you, it's more science fiction because the science that takes place in this movie does not exist. Remember the movie uh, Face Off with uh, Travolta and Nicolas Cage? That's a movie that's now 27 years old, and it deals with science that probably is never going to exist. Seconds is in that ballpark. And I said it stars Rock Hudson, but it doesn't star Rock Hudson at the beginning. It stars a great old actor named John Randolph. And uh, John Randolph was still active well into his 90s. If Some of you might remember a TV show, I think it was on ABC, called Wings. Uh, he was one of the supporting characters and actors on that show. Seconds is about a middle-aged banker, lives in Scarsdale, very wealthy, it's in kind of a loveless marriage. He and his wife get along fine. They don't quarrel. They are just sort of affable companions. There's nothing left. They have a daughter who lives in Colorado or something. They don't really see her very much. Grandkids, they don't really have much to do with them. He is essentially a drone going about his daily life with nothing to live for other than a paycheck, nothing wrong with making money, and he's got a really nice house. But clearly this guy wants to do something else. He's not that old. When the first time I saw the movie, I was 15. He looked really old. Doesn't look so old now. But he is presented as a man well into middle age, probably in his early to mid-50s, maybe slightly older. John Randolph was the kind of actor who always looked older than he was. Very imperious looking guy. So we meet the main character, whose name is Arthur Hamilton, in Grand Central Station in New York City. And right away, there is a creepy as fuck title sequence by Saul Bass. There's a name for you to Google. He worked with Hitchcock. He is the greatest designer of titles, I would argue, in the history of motion pictures. He put together an unbelievably creepy title sequence supported by another name you probably don't know, Jerry Goldsmith easily a top five greatest composer of film music who ever lived. He's not John Williams, but he is a peer of John Williams. That is how great Jerry Goldsmith was. was. And his score for seconds is spectacular. It is creepy. It's chilling. It draws you in. And this all in the credit sequence at the beginning of the movie as we're meeting the main character of Arthur Hamilton. So this guy, this miserable, wealthy, middle-aged man, he doesn't have any plan to do anything different. We don't see him actively courting, you know, trying to get with another woman or anything like that. He's accepted this is his life. We have a daughter we don't see, grandkids maybe. Wife doesn't give a shit. We don't fight. I make money and that's my life. He gets, while he is at Grand Central Station, he pretty much gets jumped by a guy who does not mean him harm. But the guy hands him a piece of paper and it's an address. Okay, it's an address. He goes home and he gets a phone call from a friend of his who's been dead for five years. You gotta go to this place. You gotta go to this place tomorrow. So without going into explicit plot details, the place that he goes to with the address that the guy who accosted him at Grand Central Station and the dead friend who says he's not dead, he undergoes radical and I mean radical, reconstruction, surgery, and every component of his being is altered. They fake 
Arthur Hamilton's death. His wife gets a nice insurance settlement and they work out the will so that with his new identity, he'll have money. And now he's Rock Hudson. He has a new name. And suddenly he looks like he's 35 and he looks like prime Rock Hudson. This is 1966. This movie is almost 60 years old and it is it fucks with the audience at a level that was not seen in 1966, certainly not in a Hollywood film with a filmmaker who worked within the confines of the studio system, with a star who was famous for fluffy romantic comedies with Doris Day, occasionally did a drama like All That Heaven Allows, Douglas Sirk. This was a big departure for rock. And there was a lot of chatter, not so much at the time, but looking back and knowing the very difficult life Rock Hudson lived. The rebirth there were a lot of parallels to his personal life. The fact that he had to live a certain way to succeed in Hollywood. So the movie develops and we then follow Rock Hudson as he tries to adjust to his new life. And the movie, it never does what you're expecting it to do. You keep thinking it's gonna go into a horror realm. It doesn't, it doesn't really go that much further. The science is up front, and then there's not much more. The movie very clearly, though, is telling you to be thankful for what you have, to not take it for granted, and to not think that there is a magic potion or magic surgery or magic anything that is going to make you happy or cause you to wake up happy every day. The idea is that just because you look like 35-year-old Rock Hudson and have a shit ton of money, you might be just as miserable as you were when you looked like you were 60 and were in a loveless marriage. The issue is you, not the trappings of you, but you, how you're wired. Seconds was not a box office hit. It didn't even really do that well with critics of the day, although there were some where they hit the ceiling. Like, we've never seen a movie like this before. This is crazy how different this is than anything we've seen. And it is. Uh, one of the great cinematographers, again, there were, there were so many top-level people working on this film. One of the best cinematographers who ever lived, James Wong Howe, another name for you to Google if you're interested in, in movies and the construction. He came up with some tricks, some camera tricks, where he was able to pull off uh, angles using lenses that nobody had used in this fashion, and it is fucked up. There is some fucked up camera work in this movie and it works beautifully. So these two films taken on their own, Manchurian Candidate, 1962, Seconds, 1966. There's a movie that many of you are familiar with from 2017 called Get Out by Jordan Peele, starring uh, Daniel Kalaya and um, Bradley Whitford, uh, among others. Get Out. 75% Manchurian Candidate and Seconds. You could throw a little Stepford Wives in there. But if you watch Manchurian Candidate and, and watch Seconds and then watch Get Out, you will say, holy shit. Jordan Peele had to have watched those movies repeatedly because he's, he's lifting entire plot points. He's lifting whole sequences from those movies. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And Jordan Peele studied the greats. He studied those movies and he turned it into something new and exciting and different. Only scene heads like me watched Get Out and said, oh, he got that from 1962's Manchurian Ken. Holy shit, they did that in seconds. Wow, what a great turn. Well, I knew that was coming. Uh, another movie that mimicked seconds was a film from, I think, 2015 with Ryan Reynolds and uh, Sir Ben Kingsley called Selfless, where Ben Kingsley is a very wealthy man who is dying, and he undergoes this kind of radical procedure, and he wakes up as Ryan Reynolds. He's about 30, maybe he's 35, but he's the picture of health. And then shit starts to go wrong, because shit always goes wrong, otherwise there's no movie. But when I saw the ads for that, I said, this... They might as well call this a remake of Seconds. It was a movie which didn't do well at the time, 
but gained a following, a cult following, if you will, over the years. And a number of years ago, it was named to the very prestigious National Film Registry. It is in the Library of Congress, like the original print will be preserved for all time. So it is a film that people like me talking it up for decades, film scholars, people who wrote papers on it, people who wrote books discussing mindfuck films like Seconds. Frankenheimer continued to work and do good work. As I said, in the early 70s, French Connection 2, it's not as good as the first one. It's okay. There's a long drawn out sequence where um, Popeye Doyle, Gene Hackman's character, for which he won the Oscar for Best Actor in the original French Connection, which, which also won Best Picture that year, in the year of A Clockwork Orange, the year of Dirty Harry, the year of McCabe and Mrs. Miller, the year of Clute. I love the French Connection, but you put a gun to my head, no pun intended. Dirty Harry's a better movie. I will argue that to my last. Dirty Harry runs rings around the French Connection. Different kind of movie. Both cop thrillers. But the sequel to French Connection is all right. The problem is there's like 20 minutes of the movie is Gene Hackman's character getting hooked on heroin. And the movie could be made without it. We don't need it. It's not really, not really expecting the police officer to get addicted to heroin in a movie that has nothing to do with heroin specifically, other than the fact the guy's a drug dealer. Oh yeah, we're going to get him hooked on our shit. Okay. Doesn't quite work. Um, Frankenheimer continued to work, and as I say, do good work. And unfortunately, none of his movies, uh, Black Sunday did make a splash, but none of his movies of the 80s, he did a film that I did see with Don Johnson in the late 80s called Dead Bang. It's a kind of edgy crime thriller. It deals with uh, like a white supremacist. Like, it, it, it's not that good. And Don Johnson really gave what he had for the performance, but the film is, doesn't really work. Um, and then he had, in, in later years, he got involved in a, in a very unfortunate situation where it was a remake of The Island of Dr. Moreau and had an incredible cast, Val Kilmer, who was right in the middle of his prime, and Marlon Brando, who Val Kilmer had idolized and had always wanted the opportunity to work with and now was getting it. And uh, Firuza Balk, who was in uh, The Craft, among others. And the original director, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Richard Stanley, the production was like too much for him. They were shooting in the jungle and Brando was being inhospitable. Was, Brando was a, an unusual guy. He, in his later years, he caused problems on, on different movies. Uh, the one that he did with De Niro and Edward Norton, the score, he didn't want to work with Frank Oz. He kept calling him Yoda. He kept calling him Miss Piggy. You know, so Brando was difficult, or it could be difficult. So in the case of this film, the studio brought Frankenheimer in at the last minute, and Val was pissed. And he talked about this in the documentary, which is a great documentary, warts and all, about the life and times of Val Kilmer, and obviously with the unfortunate throat cancer. But Val talks about his experience working with Frankenheimer. He said it was terrible. See, he didn't really... He didn't appreciate that the original director got replaced and he felt that Frankenheimer was a studio guy. He wasn't going to even try to impose his own vision. He was just going to do what the studio told him. And that pissed off Val because Val saw we're all artists here. We should all be striving for the best, not just dotting I's and crossing T's. So they clashed. And this is in the, the Val documentary where you see Frankenheimer, he basically wants to Ring his neck. I mean, it, there's a moment where it looks like the guys are going to come to blows. Frank and I are calling them for a table read. And Val basically says, fuck you. I don't want to listen to you anymore. I'm tired of you. I'm tired of you. I'm tired of you, Val. Get out there. Read your fucking lines. And it, it, it threatens to get ugly. And Kilmer says that was his worst experience making a movie. But the thing that he hated the most, other than the fact that the first director was fired and Frank and I didn't even try to do anything other than be a studio guy. Um, he didn't really get to spend any time or pick Bo Brando's brain or do anything other than be miserable in un you know inhospitable conditions. It was 90 degrees. It was just awful. Everything was bad. Now, Frankenheimer did rebound, and he made a movie in 1998, which many of you have probably seen, called Ronin. It was with um, Robert De Niro as the star and John Reno, who had been in The Professional and The First Mission Impossible, and Natasha McElhone, who had uh, worked with Jim Carrey in The Truman Show, same year. And I think Jonathan Price was in it also, but that one I'm not sure of. Ronan was a moderate success at the box office. It's a lot of car chases. I've seen so many car chases in my life that 
generally speaking, when their car chase happens, I mentally check out. I feel like the movie could have been better than it was if there weren't so many fucking car chases. You know, and um, his last like big movie was one he did that I mentioned with Ben Affleck and Gary Sinise and Charlie Theron, a sort of twisty crime thriller where they're trying to heist a casino, a little bit of like an Ocean's Eleven, you know, element to it. Um, it really wasn't very successful. It was not a big hit at the box office, but it is a film that over time, in the last two decades, gained a cult following. And um, if you Google, you'll see that Ben Affleck and Frankenheimer actually had a very good relationship. Frankenheimer was rarely the problem. Kilmer took responsibility ultimately for his behavior. Like John Frankenheimer didn't come onto the set of Island of Dr. Moreau looking to fuck with people and tear shit up. Val was just not in a good place. He was so frustrated. He was mad that he wasn't getting to connect with Brando, that Brando was also being a dick. And um, the experience of filming Reindeer Games seemed to have been very uh, comfortable and you know, enjoyable for all participants. You think about it, you work with people every day, maybe 14 hour days, sometimes even worse. And if you don't get along with them, if they're pissing you off or you're pissing them off, how much worse can it possibly be? And that seems that that's what happened with um, Island of Dr. Moreau, which I saw once. It is really bad. It's not even one of those that's so bad it's good. It's just awful. And Brando's character is completely, I guess he plays Dr. Moreau. It's, it, it's a complete absurdity. And Brando actually was coming off, a for him, a solid performance in a movie he made with Johnny Depp the previous year called Don Juan de Marco, where um, he plays a police psychiatrist. And Brando really was good. A lot of his later performances, he was very broad and you know disinterested. But Don Juan de Marco you see that he really, he enjoyed the script and he seemed very engaged. And he had one incredible moment. And Brando, you know, when he was younger, was really, really well built, very solid uh, in movies like Streetcar Named Desire, The Wild One, was a guy who was known for his physique in his younger days. He put on a shit ton of weight, a lot of weight as the 1970s moved forward. And, you know, Apocalypse Now, famously, he showed up 50 pounds heavier than Coppola thought he was going to, so they had to kind of work around it and use tricks and camera angles and stuff like that. And Don Juan DeMarco, uh, Brando shows up early in the movie, and I remember I saw the film in theaters. When I saw him, I said, oh my God, he looks even bigger than I remember. He meets with one of the police officers on the scene and immediately diffuses any bit of tension over his size, he meets the guy, shakes hands with the cop, and he goes, I look like you put on a little weight since the last time I saw you. And I cracked up, and the audience cracked up. What a great way to diffuse something like that, where I'm like, oh my God, he looks terrible. This guy was a sex symbol. Oh, this is awful. It looked like you put on a little bit of weight there. But Frankenheimer is somebody whose life and career is worth remembering. I watched um, Birdman of Alcatraz, which ironically was released the same year as um, Manchurian Candidate, and The Train with Burt Lancaster. I mean, you could say that his best work was in the 60s. See, not every filmmaker has the opportunity to do great work in multiple decades. The careers like Scorsese and Spielberg and Coppola and even a De Palma it, it's rare. It doesn't usually work that way. And the truth is, somebody like Frankenheimer, although well-respected, was not going to have the pick of the choice projects. And this is something that Brian De Palma himself has talked about, and it could apply here. When he was, after he did The Untouchables, uh, De Palma was circling uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, which unfortunately ended up being disastrous. But he thought that he was going to have first crack at that. And he was ready to sign. This is Brian De Palma we're talking about. He was ready to sign when all of a sudden the producer said, no, wait a minute, we, we, we can't sign yet. And De Palma, who had already been in the business, he was pushing 50. He'd already been in the business long enough to know that that's not an accidental thing. He actually said, tell me Spielberg and Scorsese are looking at it. They said, yes, yeah, Spielberg's looking at it. So someone like Frankenheimer, there were a lot of projects he took. He did a horror film called Prophecy in the late 70s that, again, it's a cult film. A lot of people saw, Jerry, you have to see it. It wasn't entirely successful. 
the last movie of his that I want to talk about is a film he did in the mid-80s with very solid cast. Roy Scheider and Anne Margaret as the two primary characters. And Roy Scheider had worked with um, Gene Hackman in the original French Connection. I don't know if he was in the sequel. I don't, I'm not sure if he was. But Scheider had been in Jaws. He was in Marathon Man, which is an incredible film that I've discussed. The 52 pickup. Scheider plays your typical, much put upon hero who is getting blackmailed. And you go the whole movie wondering how this guy is going to get out of this terrible fix that he's in without losing everything. And Scheider, who was one of those sort of unconventional 1970s stars, who didn't necessarily have leading man looks, but he carried it, he carried himself a certain way. And he didn't have to look like Redford or Beatty or even Nicholson for that matter. He had something else. He just had a way about him. He had a certain command and a presence on screen. You feel it even in the first French Connection. And you sure as fuck feel it during his scenes with Dustin Hoffman and others in Marathon Man. He is a dominant, dominating force when he's on screen. So 52 Pickup, he plays a guy who spends most of the film going against what I just said to you. He is a much put upon schmuck who is being, he's just getting the shit beat out of him, metaphorically speaking, the entire film. And you keep wondering, and it's, why did Roy Scheider take this part? And in the last 10 minutes, he takes over. He does what you've been waiting the whole movie for him to do, which is figure out a way to fuck them right back, metaphorically speaking. Now, Frankenheimer, um, he passed in 2002. He's actually a Queens native. I didn't know that. Uh, so he's a, a native New Yorker. He was only 72 when he passed. And... Um, it is unfortunate that he didn't live longer. He take it for granted that, for example, Spielberg is 76 and Scorsese is 80 now and Coppola is 83 going on 84 and Brian De Palma, who I think is now retired, is 83 going on 84 and George Lucas is closer in age to Spielberg, but he's in his mid to late 70s. We take for granted, we see that, for example, Scorsese is in bristling good health. I watched the footage and some of the footage of him directing um, The Killers of the Flower Moon at age 78 going on 79. The amount of energy, the boyish enthusiasm of him hopping from place to place on the set, thanking everybody repeatedly. Like a little kid, he's so excited. Did you get the chat? You get the chat? Great, great work, great work, great work. And you see Spielberg with the twinkle in his eye directing really difficult productions like a number of years ago doing West Side Story. The, the excitement that he still has. It's unfortunate that Frankenheimer didn't have a longer career and didn't have the pick of the best projects and make more memorable masterpiece films. But he will always have The Manchurian Candidate and Seconds, movies that were copied, that were aped, and will continue to be referenced for as long as people are making movies. John Frankenheimer, the finest Hollywood filmmaker who was never nominated for Oscar. And with that, we've reached the end of episode 93 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Monday evening with me as I attempt to shed some light on a filmmaker you may have heard some of his films but didn't know him by name. But if you've checked out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, turn on those notifications. Or if you caught up with this episode on the audio platform, such as Spotify or iTunes, click like, subscribe, turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 94 real, real soon. Peace.